Welcome to the Profit Answer Man, Danielle Hendon. It's great to have you join us today. So great to be here. Any chance I can get to talk about money, I'm excited. <laughs> you know, it's funny. People don't talk about money enough. And business owners, sometimes they hide from that money conversation, which is a shame because you went into business to make money. So you really ought to spend some time talking about it and figuring it out and ensuring that you're making lots of it. Because at the end of the day, hey, I'm a big fan of work less, make more. And I think that's why people went into business, right? To work less, make more. And Absolutely. yet so many and of even, them struggle. Even the <laughs> ones that did it for passion, and we've got tons of passion clients. I'm a passion-oriented business. You can only stay in business if you're not burning out and quitting. So you got to put some money in your pocket somewhere. That you do. So can you share a little bit about yourself and your business? Absolutely. I'll give you kind of my traditional origin story. It's a little silly to begin with. I actually started college as a music major. I thought I was going to sing opera for a living until I had an English professor tell us to write all about the future of our career. And I quickly realized I don't have friends in high places and I'm going to be broke and that's not going to work for life. So I ended up leaving the music major and had some friends in accounting, switched over to that side of things, absolutely loved it, and I haven't looked back since. So like most people that get an accounting degree, I went into public accounting on the other side. I did my time with a public accounting firm. Again, loved what I did. I've been really blessed to always love what I do for a living, and I think it makes it easier to do a lot of it. But then I started a family and I realized I didn't want to be working 80 hour weeks with a newborn at home. So being in the Houston area, I landed in oil and gas and I was there for about 10 years. But the company I was with ended up going through bankruptcy. And on the other side of the bankruptcy, the banker started slicing and dicing. And by the time the pandemic hit, it became very obvious they were going to close their doors. It was pennies on the dollar. We were down to such a small number of people that it presented me with this unique opportunity to take a look at life. And if I'm honest, for all the downside of the pandemic, and I don't want to take away from anything that anyone went through during that time, I think there was this silver lining for everyone of just slowing down a little bit and getting a different perspective of life. And for me, that meant getting a different perspective on parenting. Because when you love what you do, you do a lot of it. And I was admittedly a workaholic. Now I was at home trying to figure out how to get them through schoolwork, how to get them to swim and getting to know the friends and the teachers and the parents and the coaches and all the things. And I realized I didn't want to give that up. I didn't want to lose this newfound parenting perspective. So I took a step back and I thought, how can I keep doing what I love, but also be there for the people that I love? And I was lucky enough to have a friend who knew another fractional CFO that was willing to jump on a call and honestly just be a cheerleader and rah, rah, you've got this, you can do it. It's so much fun. You're going to love it. And I took a leap of faith and I would never look back. I, I don't know that many people can say they're grateful for bankruptcy, but having gone through that process with a billion dollar business, I knew exactly how to take those big business concepts and downsize them to what small business owners need and in a way that fits their business. How did a billion dollar company go bankrupt? So really it was, it's oil and gas. So when the market turned and they uh, went through bankruptcy, they just started slicing and dicing. And that's what, you, you know, I think business owners need to realize that businesses, that was an external thing that hit them. The markets change, life changes. And if you've got cash, you can ride the storm. But if you don't have cash and if you don't act quickly, meaning you really have to be, you can't keep let it, losing money more than a couple months. And most businesses don't have more than a couple months. So you've got to make sure that you've got everything kind of uh, in place for that and that it's kind of going okay. You got to know you're hemorrhaging and know where to stop the bleeding. Correct. And and those are not easy decisions because for most businesses, it's a people decision. You have mm -hmm. to let people go. And 
I think they struggle to make those decisions quickly um, when things don't go well. And you can't get back lost money. I mean, that's the end of the day, right? You run out of cash, you're done. We want to make sure that you don't run out of cash. Absolutely. It's hard, especially when you work with so many passion-oriented, value-driven businesses. People are the last thing you want to touch. That's true. I agree. So you're also getting certified right now in Clockwork, Mike's other uh, book and program. I am. I am absolutely in love with Mike Michalowicz, a friend of mine who does bookkeeping. She's one of my best referral partners and business besties. Introduced me to Mike. I fell in love with Profit First. And then as we started growing, I got into Clockwork myself. And how do you grow a scalable business that's not as big as all the EOS stuff everybody talks about? Like, how do you bridge that gap? And it's it's absolutely the the type of information that our clients need. So we are working on getting certified in that so that we can help them run a business like Clockwork and not have to be there every single day. And that's the key. You know, you shouldn't have to be there every single day. You should be able to do that unless you choose that that's the way you want to run your business. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's be intentional, right? Begin with the end in mind and then things are much, much better. So let's talk about profit levers, because that's one of the big things that I know you enjoy talking about. When you look at a company, where do you see the profit levers? So there are three main profit levers that you can pull in any business. And it's not what everybody thinks. Normally, when you say profit, and this is just the natural thing. So if this is the way you're thinking about it as we're talking about it. I don't want anybody to feel bad. This is how everybody thinks about it before they know differently. But when you think about profit, everybody instantly goes to revenue. So to increase profit, they want to increase revenue and they just want to go market the heck out of everything and sell more. That's how we're going to increase profit. Realistically, it's not that hard. You can increase profit in one of three levers. Two of them do sit in revenue, but you can raise your rates and immediately increase profit without doing anything else. And I hear the people that have told me, what if I lose clients? And we just sit down and do the math when they ask me that. I'm like, okay, what if you lose two clients? But if you raised your rate to whatever it is, 90% of the time, even if you lose a few clients, you're still better off because you're spending less time for more money and you're usually still making just as much profit. So what we recommend when you're doing this, because I know it's a struggle, it's emotional. Um, Start with your most hated clients yes. because you won't be unhappy when they leave. You'll be like, it's a win-win. And honestly, those are the clients that suck up so much time and energy that it just it's just not worth the effort. And we've all got them. In Clockwork, Mike calls it the crush cringe analysis. Like, who are your crush clients? And who kind of makes you cringe? And we all have them. If you're my client listening, I don't mean you, but we all have them out there. And sometimes it might be the very first client you ever got. It might be the hardest person for you to say no to, but it's probably also the person you're charging the least, doing the most, and not making those profit margins you thought you would. Mm, so true. What are the other profit levers? So the second one, in addition to raising your rate, is going to be knowing your profit margins. I can't tell you how many clients we have that come to us with a single income line, whether it's legal services or coaching fees or whatever that you have one income line that doesn't tell you anything about what's in it. You are not just doing one thing as a business. You are doing multiple things, I promise. And understanding what are those different revenue streams, those different income lines, and what is the cost of generating that revenue? We deal with a lot of service-based business owners who do not value the time that goes mm -hmm. into generating the revenue. And if you're not valuing the time and you think you've got a 100% profit margin, you are losing so much information on your business. And it's true. And your gross profit margin, small changes in gross profit, make massive changes in net profit. And part of that is to appropriately look at things. And, and that's one of the things that we do with our clients. We try to work through 
and have them have clarity on exactly what that is. And sometimes just by doing it, they go, oh, well, I should stop doing this and I should do more of this. Or maybe you need to raise prices in a particular area, but not on everything. Um, and for us, we use it to drive our marketing. Yes. In and that's the key words, with that profit lever. When you know it, what's the most profitable, go that's get what more you of push it. for, right? <laughs> and that's where you steer clients and that's what you market towards. And, you know, most business owners think, yeah, more revenue is going to solve my problems. And here you had a billion dollar company go bankrupt. Revenue wasn't the problem, right? No. No, there are so many other things that go into it. I mean, I get it as business owners. And again, because I've read Profit First and love it. I know how easy it is to do what we would call bank statement accounting, to look at your bank account and be like, do we have money or not? And in that realm of thinking, you're also like, OK, did I did I make sales this month or not? But it's so much more important to understand that gross profit number so that you're making the smart sale. That is correct. Yeah. I'm just amazed, like, because I look at a lot of businesses and I'm like, you really didn't think this through, did you? Because <laughs> we, we're actually, just this morning, I was working with one of my clients and they're looking to now scale their business. And so I just started to do some basic math for them. I go, look at this. I said, if you triple your business, you're really not going to be taking home much more money. And they're like, huh. Now, you got to go 5x your business. Now you're starting to see it. But then we started to brainstorm, well, what are different ways of scaling that I can actually grow my profit faster? And it has to do with, you know, setting the right expectations, the right partnering, the right gross profit. Like, by sitting down and doing this up front, we prevent a lot of heartache mm -hmm. and a lot of struggles because just driving revenue doesn't necessarily mean you have money in your pocket. And I've heard so many stories of businesses go from 10 million to a hundred million and they're still not making more money, mm -hmm. you know, and they're working harder. I mean, I would rather have a $5 million business that paid me $2 million than a hundred million dollar business that paid me $2 million. Cause the it's a whole so much hell. bigger. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a hundred X the problems and no X the, the, the amount of money you take home. And I, I don't think people realize that. And you have to stair step it and figure it out and plan it out. And then you do that. I love how you said the... stair step because that's exactly what it feels like when you're doing that growing. You go through those phases. The very first person anybody hires is revenue generating. But then some of those people, when you're trying to get to seven figures as a service-based business, you start hiring some non-revenue generating people to deal with those headaches. And it's mm -hmm. figuring out how to make sure you still get a return on investment with every dollar spent. That is true. And what's the next lever? So the next lever is what I like to call all those other operating expense costs. Everything under that gross profit line, all the G&A, the OPEX, the everything else under there is one of three things. It's an expense in your business, yes, but we categorize them into three buckets. It's either what we call a required cost. So if you think about cell phone and internet, you absolutely can't get away without cell phone and internet. In my personal opinion, you can't get away without a bookkeeper and a tax preparer as a business owner. But then you have another category of expenses that I like to call the personal perks. The things our tax preparer recommends we run through the business because it is allowable, defensible, ethical, but it actually values its value to the business owner, not to the business itself. One of my favorite examples, and I say this to everybody, so IRS can come knocking if they want to. My kids are on my payroll. Do they add value to my business? Mm, not really, but they have jobs. They are defensible, and it adds value to me as the business owner for them to be there. It is a personal perk. It is not something that is required for my business nor is it falling into that third bucket, which is investments in the business. 
So if it's not required to keep the lights on, to keep the business running, and it's not a personal part, everything else below that gross profit line is an investment in your business. And we go through and we categorize those with our clients and figure out what are the investments. So we can then ask, what is this giving back to the business in time, money, or both? And if it's not, why are we still spending it? And that's a powerful review to look at that stuff and say, you know, at the end of the day, everyone says, well, I have to reinvest in the business. And I always ask, well, what's your return on your reinvestment? And when are you going to get it? Because if you don't know those answers, then you're not really, you're spending money. Yep. You're not, you're not doing it intentionally and you're not measuring it. And that's when things start to slip slide away and not be good. And I think it's important, especially for small business owners to realize it's not always dollars. Return on investment doesn't always mean it's making money or saving money. Sometimes it's saving you time. Software is one of my favorite examples of finding efficiencies in your business. As long as you are not stacking 10 million of them on each other, but finding efficiencies in your business so things get done faster and then you can do more of them. I have a love-hate relationship with software. And, and it, the reason I do is I grew up in the era where you bought software and you owned it. Today, everyone rents software. And what I've noticed from many of these companies is they just keep hiking the price up. Yep. And the cost of conversion is extremely high. So be very careful how you build your software automations and what platforms and how you're going to get charged for this stuff. And and the other thing is sometimes they end up with five different softwares that each kind of handle a piece of it, but the one could do like, so you've got to keep up and say, can we go to a new platform? How do we do that easily? Is there a better way to do this? And of course, that still comes back to change is hard. Yeah, you know, for a lot of people. And I think I just find and, and every business is different, but the more you can build for yourself so that you are not stuck on somebody else's platform, uh, I think the better off you are. Because when you own it, you control it, you can customize it, and it works for you instead of you trying to work for it. And that's what we notice with a lot of that stuff. Oh, I totally get where you're coming from. We have clients when we do that expense review that are paying for Microsoft plus Dropbox plus Zoom plus, and I'm like, okay, so which one of these are we actually using? <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Well, and these are the things that happen. So what, what are you seeing these days? What kind of struggles are you seeing with your clients? Right now, we are seeing a lot of people having to react to those external factors. We are in an election year, which means the market in and of itself is a little bit more volatile. And unless you are like a lot of my attorneys where they thrive in a volatile year, mm. you are seeing people potentially be more hesitant in their decision making be more frugal in where they spend their money. I hope we're all being more frugal in where we spend our money, but it's taking a little bit longer for a lot of our clients to take a prospective client from interest to conversion. And that means it's creating some cash flow trouble if they don't have something to help support them through this process. So how what are they doing then to get through that process if they don't have extra cash? So if you do not have a savings account and you are not what I'm going to call bankable, if you cannot go ask your credit union about a line of credit, and I say credit union because they're easier than talking to the banks, if you can't get a line of credit in place to also create a safety net, then the next step is exactly what we just talked about with those profit levers. Can we instantly go find profit now? Can we raise rates? When's the last time we raised our rates? Women in business especially are known for not being as valued as they should be and not pricing themselves at the value that they should be. And then what can we go cut costs on? Do we really need all the things that we have right now 
on our expenses. And if the cash flow is getting really tight, we're going to get down to not just is it a good investment, but is it revenue generating? Is it literally generating revenue? And if it's not, do we really want to keep going right now? What is more important? And I will tell you, we do have clients where they're not quite in what I would say the red zone. And it's more important to maintain some stability and some culture and some of their business values. But we are being very strategic and creative with the things that are not part of that. And how can we make sure that everyone in this business is revenue affiliated, even if they're not revenue generating? So you may not directly be billable to a client, but you might be responsible for marketing. You might be responsible for conversions. You might. What other KPIs, key performance indicators, can we come up with to make sure these people are adding to the bottom line? just as much as they're being paid for in the expenses. You know, I find with many companies, they don't think that they can cut. And they're like, well, we need all these people. You know, we're all working so hard. And I'm like, I don't know that you're working hard because you don't seem to be working efficiently. I think there's a lot of leaks in there that people are doing stuff, but it's not. It's the 80-20 rule, right? They're doing the 80% of stuff that produces very little or low value, and they're not doing the stuff that produces the high value. Yeah. And because I can see multiple businesses, I'm like, well, this guy's running on this, and why are you needing so much? Because it doesn't make sense. And I think for a lot of business owners, they they really struggle with that. And I think... That's a big part of what clockwork actually helps with, isn't it? It really is finding those efficiencies and finding ways to be smarter about what we're doing. It doesn't have to be harder. Right. And I think that's a big shift for business owners. They have to get out of their head and they, they, they have to get out of the daily grind and be able to think through that. And I think a lot of times, though, they abdicate and they ask somebody else to do it. And the reality is not everyone thinks like you do and not everyone is capable of doing this. And not everyone, I find that most people are not great at creating systems. And if you put the wrong people in the wrong seats, then you end up with this big problem. Mm -hmm. You Um, end up with a very ineffective structure. Yeah. Yeah. And I noticed that quite a bit um, in general. Just it, It's funny to see how many businesses in the same industry. Actually, I've even got clients who have multiple locations and, and looking at the differences in how multiple locations are set up and run differently. And you can see massive, massive differences in, in the bottom line. Um, And yet I still can't always get them to change, even when they see it in their own. (laughs) Change is hard. Change can be really hard, but it's growth is change too. And if we want to grow, then we've got to be willing to make some of those changes. And I would argue if you are someone listening to this thinking, I've already cut everything I can cut. You've done something similar to where we just talked about, like the required stuff, the personal parks, the investments, you've you've cut what you feel like you can. I'd go back to that required list. And Mike talks a little bit about this in a different way in Profit First as well. But are there ways to take the things that are required to run your business? We're not going to knock the fact that they're required, but the results they achieve is what's required. The way we get there, we might be able to get a little creative about that. Yeah, and that that comes back to the whole concept of working on your business instead of in your business Um, and being able to do that. And I think that's a big part of it. Not everybody, not everyone does that. (laughs) No, and I will say the other thing that we find with a lot of clients, because so many businesses in this realm are cash basis. So they focus a lot on the bank account and they probably do look at their P&L and they're looking at revenue and they're looking at these things, but they're not really looking at their balance sheet as much. And a very interesting part of your balance sheet, if you are struggling with cash flow, 
is your accounts receivable and your accounts payable. And if you've got accounts receivable or out there that you're not collecting money on, then that's another place that you've got to go look for some efficiencies and some process changes. Similarly, if you are paying people so much faster, let's say you've got accounts receivable for 90 days and people don't pay you for 90 days for whatever reason, you've got terms of 90 days, but then you're paying your vendors immediately. Oh no, we need to line that back up a little bit. Yeah, and so that's why, and I, I think people really don't realize a lot of cash gets lost on the balance sheet, and most people don't look at the balance sheet. And honestly, I don't think most accountants look at changes in the balance sheet month to month. Um, they're not taught to do that. The balance sheet is always looked at as a static one-time report. And I think that's the major flaw. You have to look at balance sheets month to month and try, I call it finding, you know, where's Waldo? You know, where did the change occur? We've actually, because of some things that occurred with our clients, we've actually improved our processes to make the balance sheet look like a Christmas tree. So it lights up red and green so that we're immediately noticing where in these hundred lines did changes occur and was it good or bad and what's the driver and and how to do that but yeah accounts receivable accounts payable and also um paying down debt you don't realize that doesn't show up on your P&L and so if you're not aware of that you know everything looks good but at the end of the month there's no cash even though it said you're profitable and you're like why and it's like well all of this plus inventory right all of these things happen, and, and I think you've got to be able to to sit down and look at it. And as a business owner, you know, you can't do everything. So you've got to choose. What are the things you want to do? What are the things you don't enjoy? And then get somebody else to do the part that you don't enjoy and let them kind of go in and do it because that's the easiest way. Yeah, you've got to know what's going on, but you don't have to be in the weeds. Correct. I, I always say trust but verify. You do always have to know what's going on. You do need to make sure. And again, just like on the call before this one, uh, people aren't following the systems and processes and the checklists, right? They're not doing what they're supposed to do. And that's a culture shift. And that's a, you know, whole accountability shift. And that's what you got to do as a business owner, right? You're always You're in training. charge of the culture. Mm -hmm. Well, but you have to be intentional with it, too. Oh, yeah. Is there anything we should have talked about but didn't get a chance to? I feel like we hit on all the really important stuff right now. It's this kind of a year, cash is king. So you were, you're exactly right. You've got to be looking at that balance sheet and have some kind of a cash flow forecast to go with your budget. The budget's great. And I live and die by a budget and we run budget to actuals and update budgets for our clients every single month. But if you can't understand your cash flow, and I'm, I'm specifically not saying cash flow statement because I can't stand them. Um, and most business owners do not understand cash flow statements, but you need a cash flow forecast that essentially budgets and forecasts your cash. Because just like you said, Rocky, it's not, your budget doesn't show you debt. It doesn't show payments on debt. It doesn't show savings for taxes because we all want to be profitable and not surprised. <laughs> and it doesn't show your profit distributions and your savings for operations. Or if you are a growing, thriving business right now, it's not showing any assets that you've bought or in, like those things are not going to show in your budget. So you've got to have them in your cash flow forecast. You do. And I love cash flow forecasts because it allows you to predict the future. And it, the better we get at it, the more certain you are. And you can see problems months before they occur. And and it, it's helpful. But yeah, those are all custom built for our clients. Um, we use standard templates, but then we have to we have to make it work for them. And yeah. they actually are really simple and they don't take a lot of time. Um, but when you can do that, it really gives you the power to make better decisions and solve problems before they become problems. So 
That is true. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm not a fan of the cash flow report, especially out of QuickBooks. I look at it and I'm like, I don't know what this thing's telling me. At the Who time. wants to see investment funds? No, that's not what we need to talk about. I want to know <laughs> what came in on sales, what went out for payroll. Yeah, all of that usual stuff and make sure that it all ties to what's actually going on and that you get timely information from your people. Absolutely. If people would like to learn more about you, check out your services, what's the best way for them to do that? So we have a landing page just for you guys. It's going to be on our website. So the number four corners, CFO.com slash profit answer man. And we'll put that in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me today. Thanks for listening to this unedited video of the Profit Answer Man podcast. If you'd like to catch the full episode and learn more about what we do, check us out at ProfitComesFirst.com. We also go through the Profit First book in each and every chapter in the beginning episodes of the podcast, so check those out as well. Thanks for listening, and here's to you having a more profitable and growing business.